So we have a number of witnesses this morning and um, and what I would like to do is offer each of them in turn an opportunity to speak to the committees. And I would hope that we can um, do a little bit of follow up as well and have some question and answer with each witness. I think we've got um, plenty of time to do that during the joint hearing this morning. Um, and so if you can give me a or uh, Representative Emmons a wave with a hand will uh, will get you in the queue to ask questions. Um, I think what would make most sense is to let the folks who are here with us as witnesses, um, you know, share their thoughts with us and we'll hold our questions to the end so that if there's clarifying questions that you want to ask um, or if you'd like them to expand on anything, please, uh, please jot that down and we'll do that at the end uh, of each witness. So we have uh, right. next to us. So let's start with our first in-person witness, uh, Michael Groner from the Southern State Correctional Facility. So welcome and uh, please join us. It's uh, it's kind of a long distance. And so I've been told I'm very loud. I suspect you won't have any trouble projecting. So I got to put an earplug in. Yeah, you guys might get sick of it. You're real close. Um, Good morning. I prepared something because I tend to wander. So if I could get through this and then bear with me for a few moments. Perfect. That's a good idea. Um, let me start out by saying that I'm here today as a private citizen on my own time. Um, I'm not representing the Vermont Department of Corrections in any official capacity. My thoughts and opinions and ideas are my own. I'm only representing my personal views. I'm on leave today. The Department of Corrections is not paying me to be here today. I've worked for the DOC for 15 years in a variety of roles and locations. Currently, I'm a correctional services specialist at Southern State Correctional Facility in uh, Springfield, Vermont. Correctional services specialist is a fancy term for caseworker. You've probably heard that before. Before I talk about how things are in the department today, I'd like to talk about how we got here. From my point of view, I will try to keep it short. Because I think to address the issues that we have today, we have to understand the cause, the root causes of where, how we got here. Prior to 2019, the department already struggled with staffing due to the nature of the work. It's a difficult job in dangerous conditions, and it, frankly, it's not for everyone. Along with the nature of the work, DOC leadership at the time prior to 2019 was not exceptional. There was a lot of nepotism, good old boy networks, and retaliation from the top back then. It was a toxic and abusive work environment. Then seven days broke the story about the horrendous allegations at the women's facility in Burlington in December of 2019. Rank and file employees were ashamed, embarrassed, and disgusted by what was in that article. Especially as the story continued when it came out that DOC leadership was informed about these issues months prior by rank and file staff and nothing was done. Trust in DOC leadership was fractured. March 2020, the pandemic arrives in Vermont. The DOC undertakes extraordinary measures to protect those in our custody and our employees from COVID. Working in a prison during a pandemic is scary, stressful, and exhausting. Staff burnout and turnover went through the roof to levels that I had never seen in my career. But those who stayed, we kept at it. We continued to adapt on a daily basis against a threat we could not see, doing things we never thought we would do in our lifetimes. Morale was low, but we stuck together the best we could and took the challenges as they came at us, and we continue to do so to this day. Then, nine months into a once-in-a-century pandemic comes the downs Rackland Report in December of 2020, which, at its conclusion, places all the blame of the women's facilities issues on rank and file staff, completely absolves management and leadership of any responsibility for what happened in Burlington, and recommends, among other things, that DOC employees need to take random urine tests to retain employment. Now, I understand that not all the recommendations in the downs Rackham report came to fruition, but that report still exists. Those were their recommendations. This all came out while staff had spent a summer wearing full PPE in unair conditioned prisons, while probation and parole staff had been removed from their work sites and reassigned to the facilities due to staffing issues. 
and staff had been continuously tasked with more and more duties due to COVID and short staffing. It was just another hit to an already exhausted and overworked core of employees. Trust and leadership in the system further eroded. In early 2021, the pension issue comes out of nowhere and blindsides state employees across all agencies. The Department of Corrections sees a large uptake in senior staff retiring rapidly to avoid any negative impacts to their pensions. Those of us who can't retire yet, myself included, have one more thing to stress over, along with short staffing, COVID, the Downs Rackman report, painting us all with a broad brush as some kind of subpar corrupt employment employees. New staff that had just been hired prior to the pension stuff hitting the news are now reading that they might have to work 40 plus years to collect their pensions under the proposed changes at the time. <clears throat> they just up and quit. They just left. I realized that the pension issue has been somewhat resolved, or at least the draconian changes to the pension first suggested have gone away. But at the time, it was another body blow to a department that was already bruised and battered from years of issues and pandemic burnout. So where are we today? I sound like a broken record. I am incredibly proud to say that the Vermont Department of Corrections is the only state level Department of Corrections in the country that has not lost a single person in their custody or a single employee to COVID, which is great. We are also the lowest paid Department of Corrections in New England and New York. We're the only Department of Corrections in New England and New York with a 30 year pension. All other surrounding agencies have 20 or 25 year pensions with full benefits. Staffing is still an issue at all the facilities. It varies from site to site, but none of them are in good shape. Turnover continues. Last year, our turnover rate for CO1s was 44%. Our new commissioner, Mr. Demel, appears to be taking the issues confronting the department head on. I have high hopes for him. What he is saying and doing is slowly starting to repair the trust and leadership that has been continuously eroded for the past three plus years. But there's only so much one man can do from a commissioner's position, and it's going to take a long road to fix things and to repair the trust that's been fractured over the last 36 months. The DOC needs a 20 or 25 year pension that is just as good as the 30 year one currently in place. Asking people to work 30 years in a prison is not a sustainable model. That's why no one else in the country does it. The DOC needs to pay its employees more. Vermont prides itself on implementing first in the nation progressive correctional practices. If you want a nation leading Department of Corrections, you need to pay your employees like they are nation leading employees. Thank you for listening to me and I'm open to any questions or letting Leona or Will take the limelight from me. Let's give the committees an opportunity to ask some follow up questions. <clears throat> Question. Representative Hooper. Thank you, Madam Chair. Chairs, uh, how many hours a week are you working overtime? Historically. I've worked overtime every week from the last 15 years. Uh, some of it's mandated. Now that I'm a caseworker and I'm not on the order list, a lot of it's voluntary to help out the guys in uniform. I can work 12 to 16 hours every week if I feel like it. Uh, uniform staff are consistently pulling 60 to 70 hour weeks with no end in sight. I would say that again, please. Oh, uniform staff currently are working anywhere from 50 to 60, 70 hours a week with no end in sight. Thank you. Um, thank you. Campbell. Chair, so, uh, Scott Campbell from St. Johnsbury. Um, so, uh, Michael, you, you, it sounds like you worked uh, for the for DOC for 15 years. Yes, sir. All in the same facility? Uh, no, I've bounced around a bit. I started in Rutland. Um, I spent some time at Windsor before it closed. I worked at Springfield P&P for a short while, but the majority of my career has been spent at Southern State. Uh -huh. And you worked as a corrections officer for a period? Is that Right. Yes, I've been a CO1, a CO2, uh, a shift supervisor, transport team, correctional officer, caseworker. Chief, okay. Uh, kind of been all over the place. So just how many years were you on sort of frontline staff? Well, I still consider myself frontline staff, because, okay. but if you mean uniform, okay, yeah. um, 
let's see, I've been a caseworker for 11 years, 11 years in uniform. Yeah. And um, do you see differences between the between the different facilities around the state? Um, anything anything worth noting about that? Or well, from my perspective, right? Because I'm like down here on the ladder. Each facility has a, a different mission, so to speak. Uh, Newport does a lot of they have a lot of job training in Newport, right? They have the wood shop, the, the print shop. They do all of our or the majority of our risk reduction programming up there. So they sort of have a different population. A lot of those fellas up there kind of get into a routine. St. Albans does our sex offender programming. They also have some job training up there. They also house the majority of all our federal inmates. St. Johnsbury has the work camp. Rutland, excuse me, Rutland's a regional facility. It's, in my opinion, it's, it's similar to a jail. Springfield's kind of the catch-all. We take it, or at least historically, we have the mental health units, we have the elderly units, we have the biggest infirmary, we have the largest segregation unit. We, we, we took every, every specific issue that you could have in a correctional system and we put it all in one facility at Springfield. Springfield's an interesting place to work. <laughs> Sounds like they're hard to compare then. Um, so it, yeah, it's difficult. Each each facility has its own its own culture. It's they're all a little different. Yeah. So you talked a lot about uh, uh, frontline staff versus uh, central office. Um, same feeling, or how would you characterize the the relationship between the staff and 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 the local uh, superintendents, local administrators? Put me on the spot with that. <laughs> um, <laughs> Historically, I would say that there's been a pretty large disconnect between central office and frontline staff. They, you wouldn't see them often, right? They were just kind of like gods up on Mount Olympus. You just heard their names. Uh, when they did come to the facilities, they very rarely went out back and talked to frontline staff. I would say that that appears to be changing under Mr. Demo. He, he really seems to grasp what the issue is or the current serious issue is with the department. He understands that staff don't feel valued. They think that their the higher ups don't care about them. And he's, he's making, he's doing things to address that. And change takes time. I've said that before. It, it can take a month to go from really good times to really bad times. It, it takes years to repair the damage that's been done over the last three years. It was just, it's just nonstop. We just got browbeat. It was like every other week we were in the, in the news for something terrible that none of us had to do. There was a period of time where I wouldn't even tell people I worked for the Department of Corrections. I was so embarrassed by what was out there. Mm. But, but it had nothing to do with me, right? I, I'm, I'm getting browbeaten. People are asking me questions at baseball games. Like, wow, did you see that news article? I don't know, man. Like, I just work at the prison. I don't know anything about what goes on in Burlington. But now I feel ashamed. And the downs Rackland report, for better or for worse, left a terrible taste in rank and file staff's mouth. Yeah, it, it just it absolved. It was just all about us, what we didn't do, what we have to do, how we're dirty, how we're corrupt, how it, and none of it's true. It's not accurate. The whole reason that Burlington came to light was because rank and file staff reported it. Um, but to end on a positive note, I do. I'm beginning to see a change in how management is dealing with staff. Will it, will it last? Will it continue? I can't say, but I will say that the signs are promising at this point so what i was getting at was the, was local management the, the local superintendents do you, do you feel like they're more in touch with what's going on i mean either, um, how could they not be but do they have your back i guess is the question they have your back until they don't I, that's the best way that I can put it. And I think if you asked a lot of long-term employees, they'd say the same thing. As long as you're making them look good and you're not causing them any issues, they'll back you. The minute something goes sideways, it rolls downhill. Um, my local management team who might be listening, I love that. They're great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's, it's a bureaucracy. Right? You know, it, it goes downhill until it, it, until it doesn't. Uh, but I, I think that the superintendents and the assistant superintendents and the you know middle management, I, I do think that they care about their staff. But I, I think that the that the problem with how staff feel after the last three years is so massive 
then it's difficult just to tell them to fix it. Like, I, I swear, if we have one more pizza party at work, we might all revolt. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> pizzas, pizzas are not going to fix this thing. This is going to take some serious heavy lifting from people above the superintendent level, right? Maybe even above the commissioner's level. Yeah. But they do care about us. Okay. Great. Thanks a lot. Thanks for coming in. Hey, anytime. Um, so I've got a, a lineup of folks who'd like to ask questions. I, I want to remind folks at that end of the table, it's easy for us to remember to project because we're asking a question of someone who's sitting very far away from us. But as you're asking questions, um, please remember that we all would like to hear your question as well. So um, they're not yelling at you, Mr. Groner. They're just... <laughs> no, that's fine. <laughs> Yell at me. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> all right. So I have Representative Dolan next. Yes, thank you. So thanks so much for coming in today and oh, sharing absolutely. your perspective, your experience, um, and kind of highlight how it's a challenging situation working in the Department of Corrections like it was before, and it's been exacerbated by um, COVID and current conditions. Um, I, I have shared with my committee before, growing up, I have family members, my parents worked as correctional officers, and so understand that it's been challenging for, for many years. And um, so I guess I'm trying to see if we're looking at it through the lens of recruitment and retention, I hear the piece pay and benefits, like that's a piece of it. Like let's make it more of an incentive to work there. I also, when I hear that, I see that that's one piece of it um, because we want to throw money and benefits into a system that really isn't working. Like the structure isn't setting us up for success. So I'm curious your thoughts, like, cause you've been there for a while. What, have there been conversations about this? Like making the job more appealing, um, making it easier. Are there ways to do that? Have discussions come up? Is it, you know, changing the dynamics of the job shifts? I, I don't know what it is exactly, but what is your understanding of what's happened before in that area? Um. Well, we have suggested that we add additional ranks, right? There's, if you look at uniform staff, which is like the majority of your DOC employees, there's only like three ranks. There's CO1, CO2, shift supervisor. Um, and that does, I mean, if you look for just for instance, I'm not Jim Baker, but if you look at the state police, right? They have trooper first, or second class, first class, corporal, sergeant, uh, ca lieutenants, captain. I mean, I, I understand it's a much more paramilitary organization, but there, there's more room for adv advancement, right? There, and every time you advance, that's an acknowledgement of what you've done, right? So if you just jump straight to CO2 three years in, you're just going to be a CO2 for 27 years. But like, there's not a lot of there's not a lot of lateral or vertical movement in the uniform ranks. And we've suggested in the past, VSCA. Uh, has suggested that we add a rank, right? We, 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 we extend it as CO3 or, or something along those lines. I, I think that would go a long way in getting folks to think of the prisons as more of a career. Because if you worked in the prisons for any length of time, you're just, you get to a point where you're obsessed about getting out. You, you wanna go work at probation and parole, or you wanna go work at central, like you just want to get out of the prisons. I think that would go a long way. Um, I know Mr. Devil has talked about incorporating, you know, planning out or, or putting on paper career paths, like this is what you have to do to move forward. And I think that would go a long way in, in getting rid of the idea of like nepotism and good old boy systems, right? If you gave people like you need this training and this training and this training, and then you'd be eligible for this rank. But we need more than two ranks. As far as sh I'm, you can't really change shift work, right? Like we're, we're unique, whereas, you know, law enforcement agencies in the community, I think Brattleboro experienced it recently, they were short staffed, so they cut back on their shifts, which is not a good thing, but it can at least save your officers from burnout. We don't have that option. We can't just not have COs in the, in the prisons on third shift and just be like, see you in the morning, like we can't do that. We have to staff it nonstop. So I don't think changing the shifts would help things. And it's a whole, it's a can of worms. Because if you change how the shifts work, you have to address the leave accrual rates. And I don't see how we can change shift work. The best way to, to make shift work, you know, reasonable is to be staffed, is to not be held over or called in early every day. Is, you know, that's the best way to do it. 
you know, a number of years ago when I was a shift supervisor, Southern State was incredibly violent. It was, it, it was constant, you know, it'd be nothing for me on a Friday night to have three or four incidents, the uses of forces, self-harms. The last couple of years, whether it's COVID or not, things have dramatically calmed down at Springfield. And I keep saying to everyone who listen, like this wouldn't be a bad place to work if we could just get people to come here and work. But when I go to the Jiffy Mart around the corner and they're hiring at 16 bucks an hour, or Okimo is gonna pay $20 an hour, and we start at 1936, it, it, I hate to you know beat a dead horse, so to speak, with the pay, but I, I don't know what else there is to do. It, it, Little, like little kids don't usually say, oh, I want to go and be a correctional officer, right? They'll, I want to be a fireman. I want to be a police officer. Or, I want to join the army or you know, whatever. You, you don't rarely ever hear a kid say, I want to go and be a CO. It's not a, a glamorous job. And to get people interested in that, you, you have to make the pay interesting. Thank you. Representative Taylor. Yes, I'm wondering if you've seen any difference in the, the new recruits that come in and the kind of training that they come in with uh, over the years. Has, do you find them better trained or less trained or in, in, trained in any different ways? Or would you have any suggestions regarding the training of people coming out of the academy? Well, it's been a long time since I've been through the academy. Um, it's, it's absolutely different. We, uh, we, you know, through, you know, statute or what have you, or directive changes that the training, the training in the Department of Corrections is constantly changing, but the length of the academy hasn't increased. I want to say it's five weeks. I would encourage all of you, if you have the time, to go up to Lindenville and see what the Correctional Academy looks like, and then go to Pittsburgh and look what the State Police Academy looks like. And then you can ask yourself who's turning out the more prepared officer. And this isn't an indictment on our, our academy staff. They're wonderful, they're hardworking. Our trainers are some of the best in the state and I'll stand by that. But the, the physical plant of the academy does not promote professionalism. We, we really should think about, in my opinion, working with the folks in Pittsburgh about possibly going back there and utilizing their space. And I know that's been talked about before. Uh, they come out of the academy about as well trained as they could be. It's it's a really a learn on the job kind of job. Right? We can give you the basis, basic tools on how to talk to people, but until you talk to a guy doing life for murder, or until you talk to somebody who has a severe mental illness, the training doesn't really translate. Right? It's it's. But they do come out with a good understanding of what needs to be done. But it's it's a it's turning that into real world interactions, which is the tricky part. Well, let's let's take an example. Say um, ability to de-escalate a situation. That comes with time. You don't think that, uh, could the training help on that at all? Because it's it, it, it's difficult. Because what I could say to one guy to de-escalate him might wind the other guy up. It, it's a people business. It's the, the training in the academy gives you the root like the. Like the first building block, when you're like, if you're building the state house, we give you one block. The rest of it is all just you build relationships with the guys as you work with them. You get to know them; they get to know you in a professional setting. That's that's how you de-escalate folks. It's, nobody's good, nobody who's worked up is going to listen to a rookie. They're just not. It's just the nature of the job. They're going to say, "Go get me the shift supervisor, or at least get me somebody whose uniform isn't brand new." Um, but it does provide them the training on how to how to handle that situation. But as far as resolving it, probably not. And do you find any difference in the attitude of the people who come in as recruits? They're a lot less cynical. Like, they're brand new. They don't know what they're getting themselves into. Yeah, but as comparing new, I mean, new now is maybe they're all or not, not cynical. But I guess what I'm getting at is um, <coughs> the, the difference between a, a social worker and a cop. And coming in from the academy, are they more social work oriented, or are they the same sort of attitude that they've that they had before? Do you see what I'm sort of? Yeah, no, I get. I see what you're. Are they coming in more like, 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 like what you see in the movies for a CO, or are they coming in more like a social worker? Exactly. <laughs> uh, I think they, most of them come in kind of like a blank slate. They 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 come in and they and they're just big sponges, and they absorb, and a lot of it has to do 
with the, tra the, the further training they receive in the facility, the culture of the facility, the, the, the attitudes of the officers that are assigned as their field training officers. That's really what molds the new guys. I, I, you know, they, they come in wide eyed and they come in, you know, sort of scared. It's, it's scary to work in a jail. Um, but every, and then you're dealing with like, you know, everyone's personal bias. Some folks come in thinking that they can take that social worker role. Other guys take the job because they want to build their resume before they be, go out into, you know, outside law enforcement. It's, it's not a blanket approach. Sorry, sorry if I'm being vague with your answer. It's just, if there's so many different variables, but you know, I would say that these days, new officers come in with a good understanding and in line with the department's values and mission at this point. Uh, how that matures through their career, that's an individual career journey and how they work. I mean, you could, you could be two weeks into your career and get assaulted. That's totally gonna change how you view the job and you view the incarcerated individuals. All right, thanks. Representative Emmons. So I'd like to pick up a little bit on Representative Taylor's um, questioning. And I would assume that for a correctional officer in a facility, your primary concern is security. Security of the facility, security of the popula the residents there as well as staff. That's your number one priority. Is that yes. fair to say? Oh yeah, absolutely. And then and then you get into the human level, which pertains to the training level as well. So you've been involved with corrections for the last 15 years. Have you seen a change, a difference? in the inmate population now than 15 years ago? And if so, what has that change been? And then how has the training of the correctional officers through the academy, how is that reflected? Uh, we know that there's the inmates now that are coming in have much more severe issues than in the past. And is that what you've seen? And does the training help correctional officers um, deal with those situations beyond the security issue? Well, I have seen a change in the population. It, it, from my point of view, my perspective, it seems a lot less violent. Um, personally, I think that has a lot to do with the MAT program. And this isn't a, a uh, you know, I'm not saying anything bad about the MAP program, but I think historically, if you look back to in corrections to the, to the beginning of the opioid epidemic, where we didn't, you know, we tried to arrest our way out of that issue and, and penalize people out of that lifestyle. A, a lot of the violence in the gym, and this is just anecdotal, like anecdotal, right? Like I'm just, this is just my observations. I have no data. A, a lot of the violence in the prisons was because of drugs, lack of drugs, the drug trade, uh, people, smuggling drugs or not paying debts and then violence breaks out. I think the introduction of the MAP program has taken all that away. It's, it's pretty much destroyed the black market on drugs. There's, there's very little strong arming or coercion. And I would say that as far as the people coming to jail, I mean, sure, we still have violent offenders to come to jail, but I don't see the level of violence in the prisons that I used to fights every day, assaults on COs. It, it's just, it, things have changed. And, and the DOC has made a, a concerted effort. This was prior to the pandemic to change how we resolved issues in the prison. We, we used to not, you know, we, we, we used to not take such excessive steps to avoid a use of force. Now that's the absolute last thing that we try to do. We try to resolve everything through verbal interventions, which is a good thing in my opinion. But as far as to why that's happening, I'm not sure. And as far as, you know, again, I can't speak specifically to the Correctional Academy training because I haven't been up there to train in many years. But I will say that when the new guys come out and they see, and they come to the facilities and they see senior staff resolving issues in a certain manner, right? Through verbal interventions or the least invasive way possible, then they, they, you know, they see it and they say, okay, that's the way we handle things. And then from, you know, once you get past the security point of view, 
interacting with them on a human level, that just, that takes time. That that's the only way to do it is you you have to interact with the guys in your living unit, and then word gets out. Oh, Groner is a decent dude. You can talk to him. You know, blah blah blah. Or Groner is a jerk. Don't give him the time of the day. Stay away from him. Right? It's 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 like working at a big giant crazy high school. There's always rumors and opinions and everything flying around. Like this building. <laughs> <laughs> but that's that's the best way that we deal with folks inside is just by building professional interpersonal relationships. But I will say I've seen a change the last four years. Thank you. Representative Anthony. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairs. Uh, and thank you very much for coming in on your own time. I appreciate it immensely. Uh, not being terribly familiar with corrections because obviously that's not our traditional uh, focus. I want to ask two questions. One uh, uh, that you touched on, which is the financial incentive. You mentioned uh, that the, uh, the reward upon retirement is not as competitive as you think it should be. That is to say, you talked about the years of service. I'm referring, obviously, to the pension terms. The other though, side of that is the dollar today which is to say you sort of touched on the fact that a pathway, presumably including raises, uh, has to do with ranks. And you said that this is, too, this is an organization at the um, uh, on the ground level is too flat because there are not enough ranks. I understand that. How about though the competitive wage at any of the ranks that you would think should be there or are there now in terms of New York, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, et cetera? How would you characterize that? I'm trying to get at the attractiveness of retirement versus the attractiveness of continuing to serve. And obviously the, day, the dollar today and the dollar tomorrow are, uh, if you will, both considerations in that. That's my first question. I have a structural question to ask after, but. All right. Uh, so, the, the end result of our pension, 50% of our annual financial, personally, I think that's fine. The problem is the length of time it takes you to get there. That, that's the issue. When you, when you look at all the other states in New England and New York, we're the only Department of Corrections that asks their employees to spend 30 years in a prison. Massachusetts, and I, and I understand, right, that every other, Massachusetts, New York, Connecticut, have different, that's a, you know, different financial, uh, obligations. They have a much larger tax base, but it's it's unsustainable to ask folks to work for 30 years, right? If, if you have someone who comes and joins the department at the age of 30 years old, you want them working in a prison at the age of 60 before they can take their pension? Like, I, I, don't, I don't see a lot of 60-year-olds at any of the prisons I go to, and I'm not trying to be age discriminatory. I'm just saying that that's, that's a wild ask for someone of that age to work in a jail full of, you know, maladjusted, violent young criminals. So I just think we have to figure out a way to make it a 20 or 25 year pension because that's what every other state offers. Additionally, every other state pays everybody more, whether it's the starting correctional officer or the other states use a more paramilitary rank structure, right? Whether it's a sergeant, a lieutenant, a case manager, everybody around us is getting paid more. But they're, but they, yeah, but they're all, they're all working a, a, a type of corrections that is, that is not as intense as Vermont. A lot of states are not direct supervision, right? They don't have a CO in the unit 24 seven. They just go in and do a tour every 30 minutes or an hour. It's, they're entirely different systems. I think the system we have in Vermont is great, right? Because with direct supervision, we can have those interpersonal relationships and we can do the kind of work that you folks want us to do. But I, I think there needs to be some recognition about that the work you want us to do is incredibly difficult and more difficult than what our surrounding states are asking their employees to do. Let me ask my structural question. Uh, I don't, uh, don't, don't know the historical, um, if you will, transition to the place of corrections in state government, but I do know enough that corrections is part of a rather large agency. And I guess my question is, um, and your perspective from where you sit, is it true that the structure of corrections, that is the place in state government in a particular secretariat with a commissioner, does that structure um, 
allow the claim on resources to be as direct and as useful to the mission that you see the department has. And I say that because there are a lot of layers between yourself and the governor or even the uh, institutional head at Springfield or Newport or whatever. And the more layers uh, and the more difficult it is to reach the secretary of administration or the governor uh, generally means that it's more difficult to put your finger on a resource need. And I guess I ask that uh, because over the last 50 years that I've been around and looking at state government, obviously the place of corrections and its connection to the top of state government is very different than it was 50 years ago. And I don't know if that's good or bad, uh, but I, I want to pose the question. Thanks. I think that the way the Department of Corrections is structured leads to that feeling of disconnect from rank and file staff. Uh, I think, you know, when I watch Mr. Demel testify or anybody else from central office, I don't feel like they're testifying for things that I have any idea what they're talking about. And maybe I don't need to know given where I am in the, in the rank structure, but I feel like we're talking about things that people at the front line that are expected to implement these practices have no idea what's going on. Um, I will say that it's impossible for VSCA to get any time with the governor. He's, I don't know what's going on. People are hiding from us or I don't know what it is. We, we can't ever get a minute with the other guy's time. I don't know if moving us to the Department of Public Safety would fix that in any way. I, that's it, that's kind of out of my wheelhouse. That's, that's some big picture stuff that I'm not <coughs> real read up on. But I, I will say that it's given the layers in the department and the access to people above the commissioner, it's, it's difficult to get our concerns heard. By the time it percolates up there, it typically gets whitewashed or ignored or pushed to the side. But maybe Mr. Demel is going to change that. He keeps talking about transparency and everything else. I have high hopes for that. That will be. Okay, thank you. Representative Colston. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Groner, thank you so much for your testimony this morning. <laughs> and thanks for your service. I appreciate that. So what would um, an ideal work culture look like that would inspire you and others to make a career in the Department of Correction? <clears throat> so not to toot my own horn, but to think back to when I was a shift supervisor, you're, you're, you know, when people work at a, at a place of employment, whether it's a prison or you know, a, a hospital or any place, you know, they have to work if they want to make money. The trick is getting them to want to work for you, right? That's a leadership thing. Your staff has to feel invested, like that you care about them. They have, you, it has to come from the top down. Where do you want to go? What do you want to do? What are your goals, right? I'd have guys say that, I just want to work here for four years and go become a cop. And I'd be like, all right, man, like, let me help you achieve that. If that's what you want to do, then I'm not going to try and sit here and change your mind. I'll help. But if, in those four years, if I invested in that guy, maybe I would change his mind. It's, it's about training. It's about investment. It's about compensating people at a rate where they feel appreciated. It's about backing your staff. It's about standing up for your staff. It's It's a, it's a cultural thing. It's, and, and we've lost that over the years, and I'm gonna try and make it quick as I explain it. Back when the prisons were, were ex, you know, violent, there was a very us versus them mentality, right? Red team, blue team, right? Uniform staff versus incarcerated folks. But now that's gone, which is good, it's great. I'm not saying I miss that at all. I, I thoroughly enjoy the, the lack of violence. But that's what brought people together. You could hate your coworker, right? You could, couldn't stand the guy for whatever reason, political differences, whatever. But when the chips were on the floor, right? When things got crazy, I could rely on him and that built morale up. Those things, that, those instances, they're not gone, but they're few and far between, which is good. But we have to figure out a way to replicate that kind of togetherness again without bringing back the things that, you know, four or five, six years ago, the level of violence and everything else. It's, it's a leadership thing. I, I joined the department while, you know, we still had troops deployed in Iraq and Afghanistan. And a lot of my supervisors were prior military or they were in the guard. I never served. 
But those guys were phenomenal leaders. They understood it. They understood buying into their staff and, and building them up and, and challenging them in ways where they could succeed. And, and I think that the department needs to, to, to make a, a serious decision on how to, you know, what's a mistake and what's misconduct. If someone makes a genuine mistake, you don't need to put them under investigation for it, right? I mean, look at, look at the totality of the circumstances. If the guy was just doing his best and he made, and he made a mistake, you, you don't need to treat it like he willfully disregarded work rules. That, then that takes away everyone's initiative or motivation. They don't want to do anything. They're scared of getting in trouble. You need, you need to support your staff. That's my ground level view. That's the big thing that's lacking. Thank you. No problem. Representative Coffey. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, uh, Mr. Brenner, for being here. It's, you know, I have to say, it's it's so wonderful having you here. Um, I got tired of Zoom calls. So yeah, it's, it's, great. it's really wonderful that you're here in person. And I also want to um, join others in thanking you for your service. Um, and, um, you know, I've been on the Corrections and Institutions Committee for only for four years. So, I, you know, when I started, you know, we were hearing about the crisis, the, the worker shortage. And I know that's really, you laid it out pretty clearly in your in your remarks about all the contributing factors. So um, a few other folks have asked some of the questions I want to ask you, but I one of the questions I had was, one of the, you know, uh, you really spoke to a, a PR problem with the Department of Corrections, like because in a way, and in, in that that is one of the biggest obstacles in getting people to come and work in the department. And as you're sitting here with us today, you know, I'm I'm thinking it's like you know for people to see people like you, you know, actual people who work in the um, in our facilities and who are doing the good work. I've gone and met with my PNP. And I've been really inspired by their commitment to the work and what they're what they're talking about. And you know, your your ideas that you're giving. I mean, I'm taking pretty copious notes here because they're really they're really concrete ideas that we can what we can do from our legislative position to help. And I just I, I guess I, I have a couple of questions, but I just want to say this idea of transparency and support for our Department of Corrections is really um, one of the things that I um, think is really important. <clears throat> And last year we set up that oversight commission, which hasn't really gotten started, but I think the spirit of that was to give support, like, you know, to help the public see and give some more transparency after a lot of the stories that came up in the press about what happened at the women's facility, because it was hard for all of us, you know, you know, very much I can imagine for you all, but it's, it was hard um, sitting where I sit too. And, and I think that, I hope that that, that commission, that oversight commission can be seen as like, this is a way to have more transparency and openness and actually to educate the public about what goes on within our department. So one of the questions I had for you is, um, you know, uh, you, you based, you've been based at Springfield and um, we at the top of the session heard a lot about the print report. And it was an interesting approach, this collaboration between the University of Vermont and the Department of Corrections where they, they interviewed both incarcerated folks, incarcerated folks and staff. And what was remarkable to me was like kind of the, the alignment of, yes. of concerns. And, and um, while I don't think it's like this is a five year project, um, but do you also see some possibility in there to build on and, you know, the Springfield facility, and then my second part of my question is at that facility, should there be more different kinds of programs? Should there be improvements to the facility? It's one of it's a, a facility that in some ways didn't get finished in some like it's a it's our, one of our newer facilities, but there was a there are aspects of that facility that did not get finished. So I, I want to throw all those questions <laughs> at you. But, you, you know, I want to say my comment is like you, you have some really concrete um, recommendations that I feel are really helpful to me. Well, so I'm glad. Yeah. So print. So maybe print and the facility, um, and maybe what what do you think we could do to improve the PR of the uh, of the department? Oh boy. Okay. <laughs> and I know we have other folks here too. Yeah. I'll, I'll try and keep. I am glad you brought up print because I was going to bring that up out of the blue. So uh, for those of you who don't know, print stands for the Prison Research Initiative uh, Network. It's a it's a thing from the Urban Institute in Washington D.C. And Vermont is one of five states enrolled in this. And it is a collaboration between UVM, Urban, and the DOC. And it, it's a four or five year research project. It's a research project um, to, to look at how we do corrections and to implement change. I will say that 
Print is a five-year research project. It's, it's, it's not a quick fix. It's we're going to try things and see if they work. And if they don't, then we'll stop doing them. We'll try something else. It's, 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 and the changes come from the incarcerated population and the workforce. It's really a, a unique way to look at it. And it's, I'm on the executive committee. I'm very excited about it because I've never seen this before. I said this uh, a couple of weeks ago. Print is a long-term project. We, we can't wait for Prin's results to address the issues that are facing the department. I put it like this, if my house is on fire, I'm not gonna go build a fire truck, right? The fire, building a fire truck is print, right? We're gonna look at new and innovative ways to fight a house fire. That doesn't stop my house from being on fire, right? I need to call up the old 1985 one from the volunteer department to put my house out. So we have to address the current issues before we can get into what print wants to do. Um, I do see a lot of uh, opportunities with the print project. It's, I, I know it's been very educational for the UVM researchers, to, to get an inside look at corrections. And, and I know the incarcerated population is pretty excited about it because they haven't really had this kind of opportunity to tell their side of the story outside of you know, prisoners' rights or anything. So uh, I, I do see a lot of promise with the print project, but I, I do think it's gonna be long-term. It's, you know, it's, it's gonna take a while. Um, and then the other question was what, how to fix up Springfield? Well, P PR, and then are there things that you're oh. thinking about the facility? Is, is the facility limiting? Um, if, you know, I think I think you probably followed that our committee recommended about you know AC air conditioning. Oh yeah, was Shawanda here? Because she loves talking about. So, <laughs> I might let her. Um, Springfield is the newest prison. Uh, I can't 2003 or 2004, and you're correct that it's not finished. There was supposed to be a fourth living unit with another 150 beds that was never built. Although there is a pad with all the plumbing and electrical conduit in it. So you could build it if you wanted to. Um, but again, I don't know if you'd have the people in the Springfield area to staff that prison if you added 150 inmates. Um, as far as, pe like, it's tricky, like, no one in, under DOC supervision, right? Whether they're incarcerated or on their parole or on probation, by and large, no one's happy about that situation, right? It, it, if you're broken down by the side of the road and the state trooper pulls up and helps to change your tire, you're happy to have that interaction with the state police, right? If your house gets burglarized and the state police catches the guy, you feel some kind of closure to that issue. Most people who are under supervision aren't pleased to be there. They, they typically don't have nice things to say about the department because we just spent the last X amount of years telling them what they can and can't do. Uh, I, if we could find a way to highlight folks who have had a successful or, you know, period of supervision and they can say, oh, my PO was wonderful. He helped me turn my life around or, you know, she helped me get out of a dark place in my life. If we could highlight those stories, I think that would be positive PR for the department. As far as positive PR for a prison, that's, that's tricky. It'd just be, it's just the nature of the environment, right? It's not Valley Vista. It's not Serenity House where people are choosing to be there to better their lives. They're, they're made to be there. I haven't met anybody in my 15 year career that wakes up and says, woo, I'm excited to be here today. <laughs> um, so, but as far as positive PR for the department, I think with, Mr. with some of the things Mr. Demel is proposing, right, the career paths, the building up the special teams, building up um, trainers and just the overall changing the culture of how we treat our workforce. I think that, it's, that, that will write its own story and provide its own PR. Mr. Baker always used to say that you know, every employee of the Department of Corrections is a recruiter. It's on us to, you know, spread the good word. And Baker asked me once if I would ever recommend the job to a friend. And I said, only if I hated him. Like, you know what I mean? Like, only, only if the guy wasn't my friend would I ask him to come work at the prison, at least today, right? Like, I'm not saying forever. Years ago, I told people to sign up nonstop. It was a lot of, it was a good time. It was a good place to work. But the last three years have just been brutal. So you brought up the, the seven days article real quick. I, I want to share this. My wife could not finish that article. She couldn't, physically couldn't, fit. to this day, I don't think she's read the whole thing. She's gonna kill me for mentioning her on YouTube, but <laughs> she could not read it. It upset her that much. So, like, I, I get goosebumps thinking about that article. I can't stand it. I, re I read it last night before I came up here, just to remind myself. It's, it's disgusting, it's embarrassing, it's, it's horrendous. Um, but a call could have been avoided if you know people would listen to rank and file staff. Representative Yehovsky. 
Thank you, um, Madam Chair. So I have a couple of questions. So I'm getting back a little bit to the training piece. We know that a lot of people who are incarcerated are struggling with mental illness, have histories of their own trauma. Do you feel that COs have the adequate training to understand the impacts of trauma and mental health issues and how to engage with that in a way that's trauma informed? Uh, I would say in the last few years, the department has definitely shifted to a more trauma informed approach across the board, right? How we deal with incidents, how we train staff. As far as addressing like the root causes of trauma or the, or the root causes of mental illness, I, I don't think the training addresses that. And, and frankly, personally, nor do I think that it should because we're not, you know, we're, we're not licensed clinicians. Uh, I will say at least at Southern, I've noticed that the, the, the level of mental health care over the past two years, especially under Superintendent Lyons has increased dramatically. Um, we see, we see a lot less guys with mental health issues deteriorating, right? They, I, I don't know if they're improving, but they're, but they're maintaining, right? They're, they're not going, they're not spiraling down in, into crisis. Um, and when someone does move in that direction, at least at Springfield, it's a rapid response from our mental health staff. So I think we're moving in the right direction, but as far as frontline correctional officers, sort of like digging at the cognitive roots of mental illness or trauma, I don't think we're at that space and I don't know if we should be. But you do feel like there's an underlying sense of being trauma informed and just oh yeah absolutely absolutely yes. experience trauma. I think that's I think that I believe I mean don't quote me although I might get quoted. Um, <laughs> I believe that started before Mr. Baker's tenure. We started moving towards a more trauma informed approach, and I think maybe that's one of the reasons we we've seen less violence and you know mayhem, so to speak, in the prisons. Is I think we're moving in the right direction with that. As a follow up to that, are there additional resources that you feel are needed to provide adequate care to the people who have that, that history of trauma and are incarcerated or who have mental illness? I mean, if you ask somebody in the Department of Corrections if we need more stuff, we're always gonna say yes. <laughs> um, it's difficult, right? Because I don't, I don't work in that building, right? I, don't, I work mainly with general population guys, so I can't say one more question. definitively. I think there's the, the folks that end up in our mental health units, right? They're there because no one else can deal with them, right? I, I don't want to use the term dumping ground because it's sort of disrespectful to those folks with mental illness, but that's kind of what happens. The state hospital doesn't want to deal with them, right? Outpatient providers don't want to deal with them. They deteriorate in the community, they pick up a criminal charge and they come to us. And it's, it's, tri it's tricky to be rehabilitative in that sort of setting, right? It's not the, it's not the state hospitals or the, the secure mental health institutions, right? Where everyone who works in Middlesex or Berlin is, is, a, is a licensed clinician, right? Or, or a mental health nurse to the best of my knowledge, maybe, I don't know. But it, it's, we do, I would say that we do the best we can with what we've got at Springfield and we could always use some more clinicians for more one-on-one -on -one work or group work or anything like that. And are your, are officers trained in vicarious trauma? Seeing as how I don't know what that is, I'm gonna say no. Okay. <laughs> to be blunt. Um, and then my other question is around de-escalation training and what's provided. Well, since my time, we have a course in the academy that we, and then we have to get recertified every year. It's called advanced communications techniques. And it sort of gives you a very, like if you have no ability to talk to people, right, which is not something I suffer from, but if, if you have no ability to, to interact with anyone, ACT kind of gives you like a very basic foundation on how to interact with folk and try to redirect them away from, you know, disruptive or, or crisis behavior. But it's very, pedestrian is a tough word. It's very basic, right? It's not, um, it's not anything you would see like with a mental health counselor who rides shotgun with a state trooper or a Burlington PD officer, right? It's, it's nothing on that level. Like I answered earlier, when we, to de-escalate these guys, it's, it's typically the interpersonal relationships that you've built with them over the years. I mean, there's guys I know from my rookie year 15 years ago, right? They've been in and out, in and out. And when they come back in, right, their, their lives are turned upside down. They're scared. They're worried about what's gonna happen next. And then they see, you know, a guy, not me specifically, but they see a guy like me that they've known professionally for 15 years, and I'm a guy they can talk to, right? Or, or you know, Leon or anybody is, I, I know this person for 10 years, I can vent to them. 
And then if they go into crisis and the person who knows them happens to be in the area, I've walked into situations where guys are ranting, raving, screaming, throwing a fit. I walk into the unit and I'm like, what are you doing? And just, boo, he comes right back down because he just wants to talk to me because he feels like he's not being listened to. But I've never been trained, right? That's just me having relationships with these fellows, which is another issue about the turnover is we, if we continue to turn over staff, no one ever sticks around long enough to build those interpersonal relationships. And, and this is sort of a broad question, but from your view, are there changes to the overall structure and or culture of corrections that would improve the work environment? I'd like to see uniform staff have more chances for advancement. Uh, I, I think that's a big one. I'd, I'd like to see an additional rank added to the uniform staff. We ask a lot from those folks, and, and I don't expect you guys to, you know, to, to know the day-to-day -day operations of prisons, but you know, one day you could be working in the mental health unit uh, with, a, with that set of skills, and then the next day you're working in the segregation unit, utilizing a totally different set of skills. I think it would be good to be able to acknowledge guys that have been in, been in uniform for 15 years with an additional rank that doesn't necessarily have to be shift supervisor. I think above the shift, super, shift supervisor level, the, the hierarchy is, is fine. I just think there needs to be a top-down flood of investment in your junior staff. Like, we're not turning over anybody in central office, right? We're not, we, I don't see the turnover up there in Waterbury. I don't even see the turnover in superintendent offices in the facilities. It's, or P&P, &P, there's no turnover at P&P, &P, although maybe the owner's gonna correct me. But <laughs> it's, it's the prisons, it's a difficult job. We, we need to just flood them with support and investment if we want them to stick around. Yeah, and I guess my, my question is, is there a way to make the job less difficult? Is there a way we can shift culture, shift larger pieces that would make it a less difficult job? Provide different supports, I don't know. <laughs> <clears throat> I mean, speaking from Springfield specifically, right, because I don't work in Newport where there's a lot of jobs, Springfield needs employment for the incarcerated individuals. There's nothing for those guys to do. Nothing. It's like the kitchen and that's it. There, there's an idle hands, you know, that old adage. And it, it's true, Spring, for historically Springfield, you know, over the years was behave or else. We just drop the hammer on you, which that's not, you know, you treat them like kids, they're going to act like kids. It's silly. You got to give them something to do that's productive, that they, they feel some, some kind of self-worth. They can, they can leave their period of incarceration with, a, with skills or a certificate or something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, that's specific to Springfield. These guys, they need something to do. They're just sitting around, you know, either thinking of ways to get one over on us or not being productive. They're just they're bored. I can't even imagine. It's miserable. We got to keep them busy. Just like if anybody's got little kids, you got to keep them busy. Not that they're little kids, but it's the same mindset, right? If you leave a, a four-year-old alone, they're going to draw on the they're going to draw on the walls. If you leave these guys locked up in a living unit for days on end, they're, they they have to get their energy out somehow. And if you don't have a pro-social way to do it, it's going to lead to issues. Thank you. No problem. Representative LaFave. Um, thank you very much for being here and for being so candid and confident with your responses to us. Um, it I think it makes a big difference to. Why Steve likes me. Yes. Um, so this might not be a popular question, um, but from me, what I've heard from you is there's a lot of things going on um, in the morale that like legislation, we, we can't fix that. I can't, we, we can't write a law that says like, you have to be supportive of your coworker. And quite frankly, we shouldn't write that law. But is there anything that we have done here that has made your job harder? Is there legislation that we have passed? I've heard you say that you have heard your boss testify where you didn't even understand what he was talking about and you're the boots on the ground. So is there things that have happened because of us that have made your job harder? There was a lot of legislation passed pre pandemic. Like there was a lot of changes to the department in a rapid fire manner, right? The MAP program, Justice Reinvestment Act. And I don't know if they made things harder but it was a lot of change system wide. And it was just, oh, here's this new thing we have to do. Here's this new thing we have to do. Here's this. And that's like, it's completely within your authority to do. And I'm certainly not going to come into your house and complain about it. But it, it does, it, it adds a challenge, right? It, it, corrections is not a system built for change, especially the prisons. It's, it's very regimented. We do this, we do this, we do this. And then when, when you throw new stuff in, it just, it makes for a stressful environment. I, I told, Ms. Eamons, this uh, some time ago, I was like, you got Justice Reinvestment Act in, 
the MAP program has been running. I sound like a teacher, like leave us alone for a while. Like let us figure this out, streamline this, no more new, new things. I, I, I see justice reinvestment working from my point of view. Um, you know, guys aren't coming back as rapidly from supervision, right? We're being a little bit more understanding with those type of violations. But I, it's tricky. Like you're trying to, you're asking me to like talk like I'm in the break room and I'm not in the break room. I, I, I'm sorry. I don't mean to um, on the spot. I'm sorry. It's <laughs> change is just difficult in general. Yes. So I, I don't want to say you've made my job harder, but I do have more to do. My days are busier. As, as from a caseworker point of view, there's uh, there's a lot more boxes I have to tick off for every guy that I see. Um, Priya is a good program, but it takes up a lot of time. It it some days it feels like it's all consuming doing Priya stuff. And when people talk about caseworkers in the facilities, sometimes people have this idea in their head that or this vision that we're like counselors. I'm not a counselor, right? Like I'm not trying to get myself, like I don't have time to sit there and have hour long chit chats with these guys on life choices and, and kind of guide them in the right direction. I am constantly pushing paper. I'm constantly writing reports and, and that's, that's the job. Like I don't have a choice otherwise. I, I mean, I try to have those conversations with the guys on my caseload when I get an opportunity, but I, I can't, I just don't have the time in the day to sit there and be like a social worker because I have so much paperwork to do. Um, I will say that's one of the things that we've talked with Central about is when you add something new, if there's some antiquated thing that you can tell us to stop doing, mm -hmm. like kind of reevaluate the, like, and I, I can't say if they're doing that or not, maybe they are and they can't take anything away, but the workload continues to increase and that cuts into our time to be able to have those types of conversations with the people in our custody. Thank you. All right, and the last question goes to Representative LeClaire because we do have a number of other witnesses who are, are with us and this has been very helpful. So thank you. And I hope you stick around so that we can chat afterward if oh, yeah, we sure. don't get to back to me lunch. Excellent, perfect. <laughs> uh, I have a, a, a couple of questions and we'll do the social distancing thing from afar here. Um, I heard a lot of what you had to say today and I guess a couple questions. One is, are, are you covered under a collective bargaining agreement? Mm -hmm. Yes. You are. And things like starting pay, are those covered under the collective bargaining agreement? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the pay chart is contained within the CBA. And the positions that you have there, are they under the collective bargaining agreement? Yes. Is there anything in the collective bargaining agreement that allows for merit pay or anything outside of the negotiated salary step increases and percentage of increases. It's funny you brought that up. Uh, yes, there, there's actually, well, there's, there, it is contained in the CBA and there is HR policy. Don't ask me for the number, I'd have to Google it. Um, that specifically speaks to either merit bonuses or merit step increases. Those are few and far between. And, and last is the, the the pension, like you referred to. Is that covered under the collective bargaining agreement as well? No, the pension is not bargained. The pension is up to you folks, as far as I know. Very good, thank you. All right, uh, thank you so much for being with us. Please stick around because there may be other uh, follow-up questions for you after we've heard from some of our other witnesses this morning. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. So committees, our next witness is with us by Zoom, Leona Watt. Welcome, Leona, and it's very nice to see you again. Hello. It's nice to see you again, sort of. You're like a little dot now. Um, so you just heard a lot from Mike, um, who is incredible, Mike Groner, from the Springfield facility. Um, so... My name, you just heard, is Leona Watt. I'm a senior probation officer at the Springfield um, Probation Office. Um, and I did, um, for really sort of a brief time, work with Mr. Groner. Um, and I just, do you just want me to start talking or do you guys have, what would you like me to do? Uh, 
Well, I would love to hear you um, just share some reflections with the committees, um, maybe leaving some time for for questions. What what we're trying to understand is sort of the 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 challenges and the problem from from several different perspectives within the correctional system. Um, and tomorrow we will be hearing from uh, from some of the department heads and so we would love to just hear the employees perspective on what's working what's not working what do you want policymakers to know so that we can be focused on uh, helping improve the situation okay all right thank you so i will just start off um i have been working with the department of corrections as a probation officer um for and I hate putting this out there because this, you know, that time thing about how long have you working for about 18 years come July, it'll be 18 years. I've been a probation officer in the last two years. I've been the senior probation officer for my office um, in my duties in the almost 18 years that I've been with the Department of Corrections. I have seen many, many changes. And also, I am a trainer um, for a lot of different um, programs for the Department of Corrections. And just in the last week, I am back in the office, but I spent all of last week at the academy because the Department of Corrections is trying to make sure they don't pull staff from the facility. So they ask those of us who are in field offices to come to the academy to fill those roles when facility staff are not able to participate in the trainings there at the academy. So I deliver, help deliver ACT training. And I think um, Mr. Groner mentioned that. And it's a week long program and it is really about communication skills and it is very involved. And I, I enjoy that opportunity to meet the new cadets, the new um, base, you know, recruits to the Department of Corrections to give them a little life of what it is like in the Department of Corrections. Um, also over the last year, I think it was July, I spent over seven months um, with some of you in that room regarding the pension task, I was on the pension task force um, via the VSCA. So everything I'm saying today is on my private time. I am, I've taken leave from my job to be able to speak to you today. And I'm speaking as a private citizen and who just happens to work for the Department of Corrections. And I am very excited to tell you what has been going on in our office and how we're impacted about the things that are occurring at our local facility. So. One of the biggest things that we are experiencing is we are a backup to the facility. So if there is a, a need at the facility, they call us in. So lately, over the last year, it feels like more than a year, we have been doing the hospital coverage. And it is a huge burden on us. And I, and I don't like saying burden because there's no issue with helping the facility because they are our coworkers. We're all in this fight because of the pandemic. It's led to a lot of different things. But Springfield just happens to have one of the bigger infirmaries. So they, and they have an um, elderly unit. So they have a lot more um, incarcerated individuals who could end up in the hospital. So it's very interesting days when they have someone, two or three, who are in the hospital at the same time. And it's, our office is in action. They call us in and we're providing hospital coverage and that's shared amongst all the local probation offices. So we have Brattleboro Probation, Hartford Probation. They've added in Rutland and soon in April, they're adding in um, Bennington Probation and Parole to help alleviate the, the strain that can cause on the office because some days we'll have just our administrative assistant sitting in our probation office because all of us are at the hospital because there are that many patients in the hospital from the facility. and. Again, we are all part of the Department of Corrections family. It's just a strain when you have, we're working first, second, and third shifts at the, at the hospitals. So we'll work that until 7 a.m. Then we come in to work because we still have clients we need to see. You know, We still have supervised individuals that have programming that we have to um, talk to them about and have, we, we still have a job to do in our probation office, but we also provide extra work with the hospital coverage. And that is a very, it's a big thing because right now we have two people right now in the um, hospital that my office and all the other area offices are covering. And that means you're pulling people out of the probation office and sending them to the hospital to help out because the facility is not able 
to provide staff to do the usual thing they would do with hospital coverage. And Springfield happens to have, Springfield facility happens to have more than the usual number of people who could end up in the hospital because of the demographics of the people that they house. So those are the biggest things. And I know that one of my coworkers, one or two of them, they also, and he's incredible. He, he, he does at least over 20 hours a week working to help out at the jails when they need it, they need to fill a gap, he volunteers. So on top of the 40 hours he's giving per week here at the probation office, he's working 20 plus hours as well at the facility to try to help. Because I listened to Mr. Groner and I've heard being on the, the pension task force that enabled me to receive a lot of feedback from people all over the state in the Department of Corrections. And I've received emails from many, many um, correction officers, caseworkers, um, supervisors in the facilities telling me, do you understand what's going on, Leona? Um, I was listening to Mr. Groner talk about how that's just one more strike when they, suddenly they heard about the pension issue. I've heard about that over the last year. And believe me, I share that with, and I thank you so much for being open and listening. I've shared that during our meetings over the last, the, during those seven months from July to January. I shared that with Representative Copeland Hanses and with, Rep, with Senator White and with all the other, and um, Representative Gannon. I shared with them some of the things I was receiving from those who are working in the facilities about the, the strain that is on them. And we're currently working on the SEA and we thank the legislature for giving us this opportunity to still work for Group G for um, Department of Corrections and those who are eligible for um, the carve out that is already in place. We're working on a Group G for the Department of Corrections because I think that was a mention about, you know, we need to be comparable to other states in regards to the 20 or 25. We're seeing how that can work and be um, budget neutral because we're not looking to add to the, the deficit with the pension, um, the pension liabilities, but we're saying that needs to be something for those who work in these type of, type of jobs that are very hard and you're dealing with a increased strain, especially when you add in the pandemic. That just added so much more. And it's been a very interesting year. <laughs> and I have heard from many, many people just in the position of, you know, Leona, you are doing this. And I'm like, well, we're not doing it. We're trying to come to a reasonable solution. And having the opportunity to sit at the table with many um, representatives and senators that had the legislator, it was a great opportunity because I started to see a, gr a more in tune mindset of what you guys deal with and the type of decisions you have to make and how hard it is because none of this is simple. Um, so I'm just, you know, the field offices, we don't work per se in the facility, but we do provide support to the facility through our um, hospital coverage. And let's say that something happens at the facility and they're down, like they go down 50% or whatever, they will call us in from the field. That's happened up north where they call people in from the field offices to work in the St. Johnsbury facility because they had some issues. So um, they had issues with COVID and all of that, and they had a lot of staff out. So they called people in from the field offices to work there until things leveled out. So we do provide, we do provide support to the um, facility. We're glad to provide support, but it's been over a year and it's sort of, it's a hard process. And the recruitment and retention, that's a piece that is huge. And I am happy to say that yes, the new commissioner demo and all of those who um, are part of his team, they are making that laser focus. And I'm hoping for good things in the next year in regards to recruitment and retention. I'm hopeful. And I think um, Mr. Groner said that we're hopeful that that will be a shift. Things don't happen in the blink of an eye, but I'm hopeful that in the next year, there will be a less, it, there will be a more um, concentrated effort Regarding recruitment and attention, we're already seeing that for a lot of the facilities. And I'm very excited because when the facility is strong and healthy, it helps us, those of us in the field who are also receiving those incarcerated individuals when they become supervised individuals and we supervise them in the field. So um, I'm just really, I'm excited because I've been at the academy. 
I teach at the academy and I see the new recruits and you try to share as much information. And I think you, um, some, some of the representatives were talking about what type of um, training are they receiving at the academy? And uh, in fact, I, I just recently returned. So I have the whole curriculum over the five week academy. And there is a lot of emphasis on mental health and whatnot. But I think there was a mention that we're not counselors and we do a lot of referrals. We have mental health, you know, the mental health unit who you can refer them to if they, if an um, incarcerated individual is suffering from a mental health crisis. So I think it's just a, a huge, huge lift, but I, I am hopeful and I'm one of those people, I'm very optimistic. I am optimistic that the changes that are being enacted right now will be helpful in the next year. There's a lot more to, to do, but I am, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that the pension um, issue comes to a great conclusion that is voted through. I just have a lot of hope I'm, and I, I'm happy to put in the work. I'm happy to help the facility when needed, but it is a lot when you're working um, until 7 a.m. and then coming into work. And it's a, it's a long road. And I know a lot of my coworkers are a bit getting to that point of burnt out because you're working 40 hours and then you also add in some more work. And we love to support the facility because we're all on the same team. It's just, it's been over a year with the hospital coverage. And I'm hoping that the recruitment and retention efforts that have been enacted already and that anything else that like Mr. Groner suggested will be enacted to help alleviate the issues and have more, more, more people in the community find that working for the Department of Corrections would be an attractive prospect. Thank you for being with us this morning, Ms. Watt. It's very good to, to hear your perspective. Um, committee's questions for Ms. Watt. Representative LeClaire. Um, Ms. Watt, I kind of have a, a, a chicken and egg question here for you. Um, you referred to recruitment and retention several times. And if you had to pick one as being the priority initially, would it be the retention or the recruitment? Because obviously they're both very connected. They are very, very connected. And I think I've seen this in many emails. They're like, Leona, you need to focus. So retention is basically keeping the people you already have, right? Keeping those who are, who've been in the trenches for the last couple of years during the pandemic, who are still in the trenches because we still have the, you know, the, the um, recruitment issue. So retention is, in, is key, but you're not going to retain staff if we don't have enough staff coming in to fill those um, spaces that are empty because it's a strain. They're working impossible overtime. And I'd say impossible over time because they're going to do it, but who suffers the most is their families. Those who haven't seen their, you know, they don't see their wives. You know, one gentleman told me, he's like, I haven't seen my wife in two, two days because I come home, I sleep, I get up and I'm back at work. So retention is key, keeping the staff you do have, but you're not going to keep them until we solve the recruitment crisis and having them come in and then retaining them once we have them. So it's, I can't say, one is the key key because they work so in concert with each other. Retaining, yes. Recruiting, so we can retain. It's not enough to have the, like I told the cadets last, last week, those who are coming into the Department of Corrections to, into the correctional facilities. It's great that they're coming in, but the key is to keep them. We want them to stay. So what can we do to retain the new staff we have coming in and also keep the staff that who have been working all along. What, what are the challenges that you run into on the recruitment side of things? I mean, is it the starting compensation? Is it the perception of the job? Is it uh, a perceived lack of uh, career opportunities? Oh, I'm going to be honest. I've heard, like when I was at the Academy last week, I heard from two um, new newly hired Department of Corrections um, employees, I heard from them, they said, you know, I am really concerned about coming in here because of the pay, because I could go to New Hampshire or anywhere else and get more, but my family is here, so I'm going to see how this goes. 
we had two people who previously had been in the academy like for one or two weeks and left because they're like, no, I'm not being paid enough or whatever. And they were coming back and they were back in the academy and they said, we're hearing that things are going to change in regards to pay and the, the work life in a facility. And I was like, okay, that's encouraging because the message is getting out there. Um, Department of Corrections has that, we have that um, recruitment and retention, um, I, I call it the team, but it's a team, people who are um, dedicated to that. And so it's great to hear that, that people are coming back, even after they left the academy previously, they're coming back to the Department of Corrections because they hear things are changing and are getting ready to change in the next year. So that's encouraging. But again, I don't expect things to suddenly rapidly change in the next year, but I'm glad that there's some trickles of things changing in the next coming six months to a year. Yeah, just one more. Um, of the, the recruits, is there any particular skill sets that you look for or are more complementary towards this job? I mean, does somebody have to be just a high school graduate or do they have to have, you know, some, some college? I mean, what, what kind of skills, what kind of qualifications does somebody have to have to be considered a candidate for this? So from what I believe, and I, I, I don't know for sure about if they can have a GED, but I know that they have a high school diploma. Everyone, um, I've done, um, I've been teaching at the academy since 2018, 2019. Um, and I do know that they have a high school diploma. I'm not certain if um, the Department of Corrections accepts a GED. I don't have those um, statistics in front of me about that. But I know that there's a high school diploma element there. Um, they're able to, and they go through, a, you know, I call it that Friday, um, the last day of our academy when we're doing the ACT. That's that de-stress day because they do a lot of written tests and verbal test outs, and it's a lot of information. And th that's another pressure point of, are they able to learn all of these different skills? You know, um, we have some skills. I and you, I think somebody su did suggest going to the academy because it is a, it's a different environment. Um, but after a week, they really um, learned a lot of material they learned a lot of skills and you really see it's that it's the second week usually when they have ACT because it's an entire long week you usually see after that week if they're going to be able to move on because it's a lot of information a lot of information they learn and absorb during that week thank you other questions from committee members uh, Representative Dolan. Yes, thank you, Ms. Watt, for this. A, a follow up to the training piece of it. Um, and I might not be remembering correctly, but I'm curious how the training format, because um, I think it's like a week long and you have to go off site. Maybe you can help give a little bit of like the training format and how that helps or hinders recruitment of having to go through that process. It does. Does it affect it? I just know like that that's a time intensive piece. And how does that affect recruitment? So from what and I think you'll hear from the Academy um, director um, when you have um, more testimony, I think tomorrow, next week. But from what from when I am at the Academy, it is it's, it's look the Academy in itself, you're away from your family, right? So the Academy is Monday through Friday. And then they are able to go home and then they're back Monday through Friday. So it's five weeks, Monday through Friday. They are staying um, in off, you know, not at the academy, but offsite at a hotel um, during the academy. It's not easy on any of them. We have many of them who have children and it's hard to be away from home. But I think one of the things they realize is part of the process and I don't know how to say this, but they appreciate the fact that we're there with them because we're away from home. You know, we're like, we're here with you. We just want to make sure you have this information so you can take it back to the facility. A lot of them have had shadow weeks before they attend the academy. And shadow weeks just means they go to the facility they've been hired at and they spend some time um, with an officer um, going around and just going through a shift. 
so they can see what it is to be in a facility. So I think the shadow weeks are very important. So they get a little taste of what it's like to be in a facility, to work in a facility. And then they come to the academy and learn a lot of skills. And a lot of, it's a lot of background information. And we had some people who have been on the shadow weeks and they're like, oh, this ACT skill that we're learning right now, I saw a correction officer doing that. Now I get what they were doing. And it helped deescalate a situation with an incarcerated individual who was upset. They were able to pinpoint that's what they were doing. So it was exciting to me because I'm like, oh my gosh, what we're doing is exorbitant into their heads. They're getting it. This is something that they will actually be able to use and carry through when they work at the facility and they start their on-job training, which is after the academy. So I'm very excited about what they're able to absorb, remember, and then take back to the facility when they start officially working there. Right. So it sounds like it's a worthwhile, like the time is key. I'm just trying to look at it from the, the perspective of somebody starting a career. If we're hearing like the pay isn't great compared to other states, the benefits aren't great. The, you know, hearing like, oh, the culture at DOC is not so great right now. And, oh, and then I got to do this five week program away from family and coordinate all of that. Not to say it's not worth it and it makes it, but I can just see in this type of job market how, that's hard. Be like, do I want that? For I really want to have that job versus, you know, something else. So thank you for that perspective. Okay. All right. Any other questions, committee members? Excellent. Thank you, uh, Ms. Watts, so much for being with us today. It's a very helpful to to hear your perspective on um, recruitment and, and retention and. Um, if you have time, we would love to have you stick around for the rest of the witnesses uh, in case there's uh, some follow-up questions that, that are sparked by other people's testimony. Okay, thank um, you for the opportunity. Committees, I'd like to take a 10 minute break right now and let you stretch your legs and then we'll come back and we have two more witnesses. <laughs>